Hi there. Welcome to the End Times Guy podcast. Great to have you along with me on this very rainy Sunday, making my way down to Bellingham. I've got a delivery right on the ocean tomorrow. It's a beautiful place to be. Unfortunately, uh, it's just socked in with rain and clouds. It's going to stay that way through the early part of the week, too. So not going to be the best day for a delivery there, but it's still a beautiful area. Still looking forward to it. And I do like to remind you I'm nothing but a blue-collar truck driver, no ministry, no credentials, nothing special about me, just another child of the living God. And you know, when we have the Holy Spirit, we don't have to be wise. We don't have to be well-learned, well-versed, well-trained. It's the Holy Spirit. We can rely on the Holy Spirit to do the ministry, and that's where the fruit is born. When the Holy Spirit ministers through us normal, frail, weak, confused human beings, the Word of God proceeds. And we know it's the Word of God if it bears fruit. That's the ultimate test. Is it bearing fruit? And true fruit is transformed lives. So if you want to see if a ministry is bearing good fruit for God, where are the transformed lives? Where are the people changed by the power of God? who were once lost in their own sin and selfishness and now live for the glory of God and the good of others. Beautiful thing to see when you see someone born again. Absolutely, unquestionably a beautiful thing. I want to warn you. Well, I want to hand on to you the warning that Jesus Christ gave to the church in Matthew 24. When the disciples began to ask him, Lord, what will be the signs of the end and of your return? And the very first thing Jesus said is, don't be deceived. Very first thing on his mind was, don't be deceived. Because I'll tell you what, there is going to be an awful lot of deception. Deception almost every single place you turn your head. Now, on the planet right now, There is about two and a half billion people who claim to be Christians, who claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ in one form or another. A simple breakdown of that is 1.5 million, or sorry, billion, are Catholic, with the Pope as the embodiment of the divine on this earth, the descendant of the Apostle Peter, the first Pope. Another 250 million are from the Orthodox Church. Some call it the Greek Orthodox or the Byzantine Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, all speaking of the same thing. And the remaining 800 million on the planet are made up of various denominations, um, evangelicals, Presbyterians, Anglicans, um, Lutherans, all, all of these um, various denominations are offshoots of the Catholic Church. We've had four different reformers from the Catholic Church. Um, let's see if I know them. Wesley, Calvin, uh, Martin Luther, and yeah, I don't know them all. <laughs> Three out of four isn't bad, though. But the Reformers came from the Catholic Church, and their idea was to reform the Catholic Church, whereas some denominations like the Pentecostals and the Baptists uh, set out just with the Bible and nothing else, not trying to fix what's wrong, but starting from scratch Um, William Booth was another in the founding of the Salvation Army, Um, not trying to reform what's wrong, but breaking away from the past, starting with the scriptures as the foundation and basis. Um, Yeah, but 800 million makes up all the various denominations, and that includes the cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists, and other groups who call themselves Christians, though their teachings are not compatible with true Christianity. And a good way of defining a cult is simply, they change the deity, the work, and the nature of Jesus Christ. They can't seem to leave him alone. Um, they, They change who he is and what he's accomplished. 
declaring him to be the brother of Lucifer, Michael the Archangel, or some other nonsense, um, stripping him of his true deity. Now, when we step back and take a careful look at the two and a half billion Christians on the planet, we start to whittle the number down when we compare them to the scriptures. The scriptures make it very clear. We cannot make ourselves Christians. We don't decide if we're Christians. Jesus Christ does. The gospel belongs to God. He chooses us. And the work of the gospel is to transform us. And it is a transformed life, a renewed mind and a newness of life. And as we read in Hebrews 6, it's a tasting of the divine, a tasting of the heavenly gift. As we read in Second Peter chapter 1, we are purified of our former sins. We're given a new nature. Um, so, uh, where is, I'm trying to remember the verse that God writes his laws on our minds and on our hearts. These are all um, characteristics of this new life that is worked out in us through the power of God. Okay, it's not something we do or learn. It's done by divine power. And if we look at this transformed life, this manifestation of God within the human, and compare that to the 2.5 billion Christians, um, we immediately start to write an awful lot of them off of the list. As the bulk, the overwhelming majority, believe that it is um, through our efforts, through our deeds, through our confessions, through our attendance, through our grooming, through our maintaining certain rules and doctrines, these things are what lead us to salvation. These things are what make us Christian, and that is not biblical. So if we look at a biblical basis and go back to that number, uh, it's nowhere near 2.5 billion. And I honestly couldn't put a number on it because I don't know the hearts of men. I know that there are good Catholics, God-fearing people who um, I believe to be born again. I've even met a Jehovah wit Jehovah's Witness who I believe to be born again. So they're going to come from weird places, um, but only God knows the true number. But I'll tell you what, who are the people who have power and influence in shaping society and shaping the direction of the church? It's not the born again. It's not the people who have been um, changed and conformed to the image of Christ. Two of the people, well, I could rattle off a short list of people I will say emphatically are born again. Paul Washer, I believe wholeheartedly, I, I would bet, I'm not going to be stupid and say I bet my soul, but I, I would stand very firmly on him being born again. And although he has traveled very far and wide, ministered in many different places, he's virtually unknown. Um, Eric Ludi, another one who preaches the true and everlasting gospel. Milton Green passed away in the late 80s. Another one fully born again, transformed by the power of God, professing the words of life, virtually unknown. Um, Francis Chen. An, a man desperate to preach the truth for the glory of God and by and large unknown. It's the people like Rick Warren, Brian McLaren, Rob Bell, who uh, Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn, these people have control. They have power. They have a voice and people listen to them. Um, the Pope has a massive pulpit and affects a, an awful lot of people. And I'm learning in the last little while, his effect goes well beyond the Christian church and in some very nefarious ways. He has a massive influence on the earth. Kings literally bow to him. And, you know, let me tell you what the Pope is doing in a simple analogy. Take a bag of mixed vegetables and pour them in the toilet. 
and stand back and scrutinize. You have kidney beans and corn and carrots and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and little baby water chestnuts. I, I believe that's the right name for them. They're hor- horrible things. Bits of onion and green bean and c- celery in there. A multitude in one toilet or one planet. Well, someone just reached for the flush handle, and that was the Pope. Drawing all together as one. But you know what? Uh, true unity isn't around the Pope. True unity isn't around Joel Osteen or or Benny Hinn, or Creflo Dollar, or what's his name, Joseph Prince, um, true unity can only ever be around Jesus Christ. And yet the Pope is drawing not only all Christians together, but all religions together. And he's been, this Pope Francis has been very successful, very busy and very successful at uniting world religions and uniting the the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Reformed churches as well, all under the headship of Rome. And I'll tell you what, this is happening under our very, uh, before our very eyes right now. People in the evangelical movement are going to Rome to meet with the Pope. Rick Warren is one of them. And, uh, having meetings with the Pope and discussing unity, uniting the Church of Christ, of course, with the the Pope as the head of the whole body of Christ. And this is horrific. This is absolutely disastrous for the message of the cross. The Pope is by no means Christian. His teachings on um, the... the, uh, environment, the ecology, and our stewardship, and our, um, you know, he, he's rewriting the Bible so that sins against the environment are the same thing as sins against God. He rewrote the Lord's Prayer because Jesus got something wrong in there in saying that, um, lead us not into temptation, and good thing the Pope, who is smarter than Jesus, fixed it for him, you know, Although I can't understand why the Pope doesn't read his Bible, he can see clearly that it was the Spirit of God that led Jesus to be tempted in the wilderness by Satan. It was the Spirit of God that led him there. So, you know, I wish the Pope would read his Bible, but this is what we're dealing with. A man who has no respect for scriptures and no respect for Jesus Christ and yet influencing the world and drawing them together. I can really see this becoming one world religion, if he gets on his soapbox about the environment and interfaith, uh, interreligious dialogue where all the world faiths are treated equally and with respect and all given a voice and a right to do their chants and their, their rituals alongside him in Vatican City, that we can really see the emergence of one world religion. Now, this influence is going to fit, uh, trickle down into Western evangelicalism. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking we're ripe for it, too. I'm thinking the Western church is ripe for this because the environmental religion is acceptable in everyone's eyes. It's a good cause. It's a good thing to champion. There are some evangelicals now who are promoting good stewardship of the environment as a means of drawing people into their churches. And and this is why I say the environment could become the catalyst for a one world religion. And with a little prophetess like Greta Thunberg whipping people up with fear, and and she is really speaking loud and clear to the youth, um, this could very quickly in in a short period of time become a world religion incorporating the paganism, um, the different religions of the world, the Indians, the Buddhists, the Muslims, all of us coming together as one. You know, Jesus said, don't be deceived. They may have peace. They may have unity. They may have a, a good dialogue and they may accomplish some good things. But I'll tell you what, it's all together been groomed and planned and put in place by the Antichrist.
And this is all part of his overall reach for control. So my word to you is don't be deceived, even if every single person in your church goes along with it. Do you have the strength to stand alone? Because I'll tell you the truth. I can afford to. I don't care about your money. I don't care if you like me or not. I get to say the truth without any fear of repercussions whatsoever. And the truth is, if you're not being united with Jesus Christ, literally and truthfully, then there is no real and lasting unity. Those you gather around who are born again and put Jesus Christ as the center of their lives, you have eternal unity. You have something that transcends anything the Pope could ever dream of building. You see, Jesus Christ is building the eternal kingdom right now. And those who are united with Christ become united on this earth. And I'm united with many brothers and sisters whom I love desperately and would give my life for without even asking. But I will be united with them throughout eternity. We will always be brothers and sisters forever. Because the kingdom that we are a part of is an everlasting kingdom. I store my treasures there because that's where they're going to stay forever. I'm not going to lose them. The economy isn't going to turn bad and empty my pockets. It's all up there. And I'm excited to go home because I'm stockpiling a lot of treasure up there. And I can't wait to get up there and see all that I've gotten. But yeah, it sounds a little greedy, but that's the advice of the Bible. Store your treasure in heaven. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And it changes your way of looking at things. You look at the afterlife as your real life, the real place where your real life begins. You're no longer worried about death and wondering whether or not you make the cut. It, just live it. Never mind trying to learn and figure it out. Just live it. And all of a sudden, you're not so worried anymore. It's not such a fear. It's more of an excitement. It's more like the homecoming and the, the payday and the holiday and everything rolled into one. So I want to leave you with that word that you're going to see the ramping up of, of deception to a degree I never dreamed was possible, and it's going to happen really, really quickly. And I'll tell you what, if you're not firmly planted in the word of God, you will be deceived. If you're firmly planted in the word of God, you will not be deceived. You will not be overthrown. But if you do not know your Bible, if you do not know the truth, you can be misled. You can be deceived. So God bless you. Be stubborn like a mule, strong like an ox, and gentle like a dove. God bless you.